Part one. Listen to the news report about a robbery, and then complete the notes from the detective's notebook. First, you have some time to look at questions one to six. There has been an armed robbery this morning at the Halifax Building Society's branch in Edward Street. John Brings is at the scene with Detective Sergeant Henry Lawson. Detective Sergeant, can you tell us what you know about the robbery? Yes, the raid took place this morning, shortly after eleven thirty, when a man accompanied by a woman went into the offices of the、uh, Building Society and asked to see the manager. Uh, there were no other customers in the building at the time. They were let into the manager's office, and the woman produced a gun from her handbag. Then they took the manager back out of his office and made him tell the cashiers to hand over all the money they had in the tills and in the safe.、Uh, it came to about twenty-five thousand dollars. Presumably, you have a number of witnesses. Yes,、uh, we have a good description of both of them.、Uh, the man was about one meter eighty centimeters, around thirty-five years of age, with blue eyes and short, curly red or ginger hair. He was wearing jeans, a green sweater, and a three-quarter length blue coat. When he spoke to the cashier when he came in, he called himself Mister Erickson, but we doubt whether that is his real name. But we do know that maybe his real name. He also spoke with a strong Scottish accent, which may help us to trace him. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions seven to ten. And what about the woman? Now she is in her early twenties, slim and quite tall, about one meter seventy centimeters. She was wearing a long white raincoat, which was quite loose fitting and which she didn't take off. She had a beige handbag, which they used to hide the gun in. She's got straight, shoulder-length blonde hair, blue eyes, and like the man, has a noticeable accent. Do you have any other information? Yes, the car they used was seen by two or three people. It's a blue or dark blue Ford Escort, and we have the registration number, and it's G five nine five E R I. I'll say that again. It's G five nine five E R I. Now the car was stolen from Bishopstone just over a week ago. So if anyone has seen it in the last week, we would like to hear from them. We also know that the car's front left headlight was broken when it was stolen and is still broken. We think. So you would like information from the public about the car? Yes, and the people. We're appealing to anyone who thinks they may recognise the two robbers or know anything about the car. We've set up an incident room in Swindon, and the telephone number is double seven four five two nine. So we would like people to ring us if they have any information.、Uh, and of course, all calls will be dealt with in the strictest confidence. Thank you very much. Thank you. And the number again, if you have any information, is double seven four five two nine. And now back to the studio. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers.
Now it turns to part two. Part two. You will hear a talk at an open day at an alternative health club. First, you have some time to look at questions eleven to fifteen. Good morning, and welcome to the open day of our new alternative health club here at Chelsea Bridge. I have to say, it is very pleasant to have so many people turn up. My name is Harry Wilkinson, and I work as one of the nine permanent staff members employed here at the club. The main aim of the open day is to give you a quick tour of the building. But before we do that, I'd like to introduce you to a few people employed at the club. Not all of us are here at the same time. In case you need to contact any of us, our contact details are here on the notice board below the photographs. First of all, this is Sean Bond, who is the technical manager, and his job is to supervise equipment like computers and all the electrical equipment. And this is Margaret Lloyd. Her main function is to oversee training, and she is therefore in charge of all the full and part-time therapists. The next important person I need to introduce you to is James Todd. He is our liaison officer. What he does is manage bookings for the club rooms and equipment, as they are open to different organizations, from the local college. To corporate clients like banks and so on. Last but not least is our physiotherapist Edward Marks, who works part time Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. Edward plays an important part in the life of the club. His main role is to prevent injuries. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions sixteen to twenty. Now for the various amenities. You see that the club has quite a large capacity, and is arranged over three floors. There is a lift by the reception and the stairs. On the ground floor, there are two large halls, which are used for yoga, tai chi, pilates, and dance and fitness classes for different age groups, with a shop and cafeteria over here. On the first floor, we have a full range of fitness machines, which are available in the large central hall, around which there are various offices. The changing rooms are also on this floor. On the second floor, there is a series of small therapy rooms with waiting areas for clients. These may be booked by individual therapists. There are also three classrooms, which are used for teacher training and group therapy classes. We have a very extensive therapy training program accredited to the University of Manwich, with training in counselling, for which we have three programs at the moment. As regards the various types of yoga, acupuncture, and the Alexander technique, there are currently nine different training classes going on. Information about the training can be obtained from the brochure, which you can pick up at reception and from the club website. There will be a chance to talk to trainers for those interested in counselling this Saturday at 10 a.m. For yoga, etc., there will also be an informal gathering of trainers on Thursday at 4:30 p.m. So, if you are interested in becoming involved, this is your chance. That is the end of part two. 
You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part three. Part three. You are going to hear a guide named Matt, who is introducing their trip in Wildlife Haven. First, you have some time to look at questions twenty-one to twenty-five. Well, good morning, everybody. My name's Matt, and I'm one of the three guides here at Wildlife Haven. Our job is to make sure that you all have a great time here with us and go home feeling happy and relaxed. As you can see, we're away from the city in a remote area between a national park and the sea. To encourage you to relax, there are no radios or TVs, and the only phones and newspapers are in the office. So. If peace and quiet is what you've come for, this is the place to be. From your cabin on the hill, you'll find you have the national park behind you, and you can look out from the sea from your front balcony. Your luggage will be unloaded from the bus and taken to your rooms in a few minutes. Once you have picked up your key at reception, please locate your room and check that all your luggage has arrived. The daily program here at Wildlife Haven is flexible. And only as demanding as you want it to be. You should each have a brochure setting out the facilities and various walking tracks you can take. And on the bus, you are given a green sheet setting out a number of group tours in the coming week. If you want to join any tour, just write your name and room number on the relevant sheet along the wall here. Tomorrow, there is a beachcombers and rockhoppers tour exploring marine life in the rock pools along the beach. Or, if you'd prefer to go inland, there's a guided forest walk that takes you off the walking tracks. If you want to catch some lunch, you could join the beach fishing expedition. And at night, you'll see there is a moonlight forest walk that leaves each night at 7 p.m. So there is plenty to choose from at Wildlife Haven, and of course, that includes just sitting on your balcony watching the waves roll in. But I would recommend my favorite tour, the waterfall walk. This departs at sundown each day, and also provides the opportunity to have a moonlight swim. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions twenty-six to thirty. You've chosen to visit us in January, which is one of our hotter months. And although you may be tempted to wear a minimum of clothing, you should always take precautions against injury, particularly in the national park. This includes sensible footwear. You'd be surprised how many of our guests ignore this advice and end up being sorry. And socks are a good idea too. And even though you might be under trees a lot of the time. It's a good idea to wear a hat in this hot climate. There's no need to be too concerned about walking in the national park, provided you use common sense. It's true that there are poisonous spiders in the park, but they are really more frightened of you than you are likely to be of them. I should also warn you against eating any wild berries. Some are edible, but you should avoid them all. We'll provide all the food you can eat. Well, that's about all for now. 
Dinner is from 6 to 8 p.m. in this building. That is the end of part 3. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part four. Part four. I'd like to go over some simple security measures today. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Hello everyone. I'd like to go over some simple security measures today. As you all know, there have been a few small incidents with students' possessions being lost or stolen, and as the student representative for Middlesex Hall of Residence, I'd like to remind everyone of a few simple things we can do to make our accommodation safer for everyone, and to remind everyone of the security measures already in place. First of all, I'd like to go over what security measures are already in or around the halls of residence. As you turn off the road into Middlesex Hall, there is a security barrier for people arriving by car. Students, or anyone else for that matter, have to report to security through the speaker before they can even enter the car park. Once they're in the car park, we have CCTV that's closed circuit television, linked directly to the security office, so that anyone coming into the front entrance via the car park can be seen by the person on duty. We also have cameras around the Hall of Residence. The film from the CCTV is kept by security in case there is a problem and we need to send the film to the police to help identify the person. So, barriers and CCTV. In addition to these, there is security lighting in the car park and around the Hall of Residence, which is on from night to morning. These security measures are there to help, but the really important thing is the front entrance. At the front entrance is a keypad lock. Now, as you all know, to open this, you need your student card and the four-digit security code. As you also know, you should not give this code to anyone you do not know, and you should never let anyone into the Hall of Residence. Remember that for all security measures we take, if you let someone into the hall, then anything we do to keep students' possessions safe will not help. After the front door, we have the reception desk. Now, this is manned 24 hours a day, but the security guard has a lot to do and may not be there all the time. If you need to call security, go to the nearest phone or call on your mobile. The number is 966 and they will be with you as soon as they can. The next thing I want to mention are your own personal security measures. By this I mean the locks on your room door and window, your personal alarm and the university bus. All student rooms have a swipe lock that we open with our student cards. Do not leave your room door unlocked if you're going out for a long period of time and do not leave your card in a place where someone can pick it up and enter your room. This is, of course, common sense, but people still leave their rooms unlocked and still leave their cards around. The next thing is your room window. Everyone has a key for their window, and everyone should try to keep their windows locked when they are out of the building. However, the security guard has told me that he often finds windows open, and even worse, he finds windows open on the ground floor. Please don't do this. It's an invitation to a burglar to enter the hall and take people's things. Finally, two more items, personal alarms and the university bus. Now, the Students' Union gives every student their own personal alarm if you go to collect it. 
A personal alarm is something that gives out a loud noise if you press it when you think you may be in danger. It lets people know where you are and that you need help. The second thing you can do is use the university bus. It takes students from the campus to the town and to other places on campus. It goes every half an hour and it's free, so please try to use it, especially after dark. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.